And yet, you know, we talk about drugs. Um, one of the episodes we did this season uh, was about, that's coming out soon, is about MDMA. Mm. And we also looked at sort of the therapeutical side of MDMA. But one of the reasons why I became interested in reporting on MDMA I grew up with going to parties that there was ecstasy all around me, never tried it, knew some friends actually that tried it and it didn't go so well for them. They still have, like you were talking about your friend with the weed, mm -hmm. how they went off the deep end a little bit. Oh, they went off the deep end with MDMA? Yeah, one, one friend I know that used to go to these parties and I, I knew her well and she, um, yeah, she went off the deep end. Um, I haven't been in touch with her for a while, but it wasn't, it wasn't a good, it, it, it doesn't hit everybody the same way. Well, um, not only that, I, I think a lot of people were doing it almost every day. There's, there was a lot of people that I had heard of mm -hmm. that were going to these parties and raves and they were just, they just couldn't wait to get back mm -hmm. to that state because that state of being high on MDMA was so wonderful and so mm -hmm. lovely and just so, you know, everyone was like dancing and touching mm -hmm. each other's hands and Have you tried hugging. It? Yeah. It's yeah, I tried it. It's the love it. drug, right? It's called the love drug yeah. because of it. It r removes all of your inhibitions. Uh -huh. You have zero inhibitions, and you feel so nice, and feel really? so yeah. You so feel so. You, it's like you don't worry about anything. You just fill with love. You mm -hmm. know, it just it just fills you with, I guess, dopamine and serotonin, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. And you're just overwhelmed by. It. And I was thinking, like, imagine if you could, if this could be engineered where humans could have an elevated level of this all the time, you would have the most wonderful world, but probably nothing would get done. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, know? I'm sure there's a flip side to that. <laughs> 100%, there's a flip side to everything. But if there was a way to, I was thinking like it was a way to, to, get, to maintain that state where you, you had an elevated level of uh, serotonin, like people would treat people so much differently. Yeah. I'm sure, yeah, there's a real, again, it was one of those drugs that when we, the episode we did, there's a lot of people who are real believers in MDMA mm. and talk about it, how it's being used pharmacy, uh, therapeutically. Um, but obviously, there's a flip side to that, too. So yeah. the reason we decided to investigate MDMA was because I got an email from my son's school in L.A., and uh, it was from a, a, a basically warning parents that there'd been a kid in a school close by, a high schooler who died thinking they were taking an ecstasy pill and it was laced with fentanyl. Mm. Really sad story. But it got me thinking, so where does, who's making ecstasy? Where is it being made? How is it being made? How is it getting here? And then I found out that the biggest, I don't know if you know this, but the sort of the center, the best MDMA is actually coming from the Netherlands in Europe. Mm. And the drug business there um, have sort of transformed the country into what many people call a narco state. Um, so journal, there was a very high profile crime journalist called Peter de Vries who was killed as he was on the streets of Amsterdam as he was coming out of work one day. Um, lawyers that were representing this guy that was a whistleblower for one of the big drug leaders uh, was also killed. Um, so there's insane things happening um, in, in Holland right now, and a lot of it because of the drug trade and partly because of MDMA. There were videos of uh, torture chambers found. The police did a raid on a place that was uh, being used as torture chambers for rival groups. It's Ugh. crazy. We, yeah. we had heard about that. Who, who brought that up recently, Jamie? Someone brought that up about Moroccans and mm -hmm. like... Yeah. The Netherlands. That's Who right. Was it? Was it Peter Zion? Peter Zion, was it? Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. It was fairly recently. Yeah. But yeah, that's terrifying. And that's what you get when things are illegal. You get organized that's crime. Right. I mean, that was the prohibition in the mm -hmm. United States. The the It propped up organized mm -hmm. crime in the United States. Yeah. So what happened in Portugal, actually, we talked about how it was decriminalized and beca why it was such a success is the rates of incarceration went immediately down. The rates of AIDS went down. People are basically given an option whether they want to go to rehab or if they're caught with a certain amount over a certain amount or if they want to uh, go to prison. And of course, most people just choose to go to rehab. Right. And, you know, the rates of addiction have gone down. There are safe places for people to use drugs. And it really has been an incredible success in Portugal. And I keep telling everyone who wants to listen to me that we should emulate that or at least try to. Uh, because Yes. Yes. But I think we already are so deep 
in this problem in the United States is that the cartels are bringing these drugs over here in such high numbers, mm-hmm. and they obviously have a very ruthless organized crime business. And even if it's decriminalized, they're still going to be controlling the supply and demand. It's true, and it, that happened with weed in uh, in California. So an episode we did last season was about weed and how the black market for weed, the illegal weed market, is actually three times bigger than the legal market, even after it's been legalized in California. And that is because the government has made it so difficult for people to get a license and so costly that they people just decide to continue running their weed business illegally. Well, not only that, but they've also made it so that growing marijuana, even with the intent to distribute, is just a misdemeanor. So if you are, so there was a man named John Norris, who we had on the podcast, who uh, wrote a book called Hidden Wars, and he was a game warden. And in California. Mm-hmm. So, oh, I listened to that book. It yeah, was really good. Really mm-hmm. interesting because his original job was just to find people that, mm-hmm. you know, were violating fish and game laws, like yeah. catching too many fish or something mm-hmm. like that. And they found a creek that had dried up and mm-hmm. it had been diverted to this illegal grow op on, you know, national yeah. land. And that these uh, forests. Yeah, uh, we, we filmed uh, some of mm, them. And it's crazy. crazy. You're out. We, we took, the police went in. We went on a big raid with the police. They went in. They were rappelling down helicopters. We had to hike in, and it was hours and hours with all our gear to try to get to this place. It was in the middle of nowhere, and it was, you know, fields and fields of mm-hmm. illegal weed, and it was all controlled by the cartel. We actually managed to speak to one of them that was there as a worker, and that's the really sad part of it. Oh, is yeah. that a lot of them are just, you know, sure, getting paid poor. nothing for. Yeah, yeah and they're with. risking their lives, and they're camping out there. Yeah, yeah. I have a friend who works on a ranch in California who discovered one of those. Yeah. Oh wow! They, yeah, they they stumbled upon these pipes, these plastic yeah, uh, pipes. Exactly. That, these guys had carried these in uh-huh. fifteen, twenty miles on yeah. their backs. Mm-hmm. And, and set this up. And he was like, if they were doing something legal, I mean, these guys are hard workers. Yeah. Like you would say, like, this is a guy I'd mm-hmm. want to hire. Like, the, how mm-hmm. how much ingenuity, how much hard work and discipline to, to carry these things yeah. so deeply and, and to set this all mm-hmm. up. But that's the thing with all the black markets, I feel like I, I investigate, that there is so much entre- entrepreneurship and, yeah. uh, you know, these they're really smart. And, again, I think that a lot of them, if they were given – Again, not all, but a lot of them, if they were given the legal route, they would have been amazing members of our society. Yes, a lot of them. Not all. The the people at the top, though. (laughs) Oh, no. No. I mean, they're probably too far gone. But the people at the top wouldn't be at the top if they didn't have people working and making them money. Yes. Those are the people. Yeah. And yeah, that's the real problem with poverty, right? The real yeah. problem with poverty is like it incentivizes people to do crime because they're so desperate. The, yeah. the, the life sucks so bad. They're willing to do illegal mm-hmm. things just to try to get by and, and do something.